first of all, you are all very, very welcome back. You are the Supreme Zero supporters. Uh, so a big round of applause for ourselves. Can we just shake it up this morning because it feels a bit weird talking to an empty room here on my own. Um, I actually, there's a few things, um, for those of you here who are friends who are currently not here having coffee, I need to spread a very important message. Well, you know that we have our award ceremony this evening for, we have 83 best practices and policies. Now we need all the awardees to get in touch with their anchor. Um, there are five groups, that means there are five anchors, and each anchor has already been in touch via email with the awardee. And we need them to make sure that that's confirmed with their anchor before two o'clock today. And that's just to ensure that we have a smooth flow of our award ceremony because it's a really big ceremony and we want to make sure that we have the right person receiving the award. So for those in, in the room who are an awardee, please get in touch with your anchors. And for those of you who have friends who are also awardees, will you please let them know and I'll make the same announcement again. The second thing I want to say is, um, look, we really appreciate this year has been the best timekeeping ever. Um, and yesterday, like, I don't know what happened, but we just flew it and we were so on time. So thank you very much, but you guys are the people on time. So I'm speaking to the choir, but thank you all so much. Um, it makes a huge difference because this conference is so packed. And I just personally want to say, I really appreciate it as does the Zero team. So thank you very much. You've been amazing. Now, we have a great quick whip of a start for day two at Zero. And it just shows you how big this conference is that to introduce our first keynote speaker, I have not met this man, um, which I am really embarrassed about um, because he and I have been here from the very beginning, which is we've had seven years of the Zero Conference and I've been moderating. I wish I could accuse my blindness as being the reason that I haven't seen you, but that is not the reason. Um, actually, it is just such a pleasure when you hear people coming back year in, year out and Luis Gallegos is no, has been here from the beginning, but he has several hats. Now, today he's speaking as the chairman of G3 ICT, but that is only one of this gentleman's hats that he wears. He wears several hats as a very, very, very committed and long experience in the field of disability. And even just speaking to him there for the three or four minutes that I had, I was wishing that we could sit down and have a big cup of coffee to catch up properly, but it is an absolute joy to have you come back and it is wonderful for you to open the morning. So please, a big round of applause. Good morning. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be back at, uh, at Zero Project. Um, uh, I have the distinct honor of being chairman of the board of G3ICT and also the President of the Advisory Com uh, Council of the Institute of Public Policy and Disability at American University, and a Senior Advisor at the Harvard Project for Disability. I will be talking uh, today about accessibility in Article 9. Uh, fundamentally, let me see if I have a first slide here. Can you put the first slide? I apparently... Oh, okay, fine. Here, the, as you know, and many of the speakers have related to this issue, uh, we began the process of negotiation for the CRPD in 2002. It was a decision by the General Assembly that we, that we meet in New York to draft what was a, a, a concept of a, a treaty for the rights, the human rights of persons with disabilities. I had been uh, uh, involved in this process since 1998 as ambassador of Ecuador in Geneva, where we submitted a, a, a petition by various countries that uh, the High Commissioner of, of Human Rights write a report on the need for a special treaty to protect the rights of persons with disabilities. Although they were covered in other instruments and other treaties, they were not fully engaged and not directly engaged as a convention directed at persons with disabilities. So from 2002 to 2006, a process of negotiation began in the halls of the United Nations in New York. Uh, it was a complicated uh, process because uh, I can tell you a personal anecdote that uh, I was asked to chair this group 
And uh, my people in my embassy, Ecuador normally has smaller embassies, I asked them, we're going to have to negotiate a treaty, uh, and they told me we don't have the human power or capacity to, to deal with, with a treaty negotiation. Um, but um, I spoke to my wife, Fabiola, uh, uh, who's with me today, and she, and she said, no, who, it's politically incorrect to be against disability. So this will be a very easy issue. You know, you're, you're, this, people will sit down, they will recognize the importance of this, and I think it will, it, it will rather facilitate that. Well, uh, at the first meeting, we ran into uh, two adversaries of the, of the treaty. One was the United States, who adamantly wanted and did not want a treaty, and the European Union. And the European Union uh, began a process of very powerful groups of, uh, of doing this, but I may say, and I am very happy to, to, to tell you, that now the convention is the most successful one in the history of the United Nations. It's been signed by 175 countries, uh, uh, signed and ratified. And the optional protocol for individual complaints against countries or other institutions has been signed and ratified by 95. It's considered the first treaty of this century, and it's considered the most successful one. Um, we dealt with this negotiation from a perception that I am a diplomat, I'm a negotiator. I'm not a specialist on disability. The specialists on disability are the persons with disabilities. So we needed their input in the negotiation, and that's when the, the, the war cry uh, of nothing about us without us came into real formation. We met with the NGOs, we met with the Civil Society on Disability, and they guided the process of these diplomats and negotiators in the UN halls to understand with a relative knowledge of, and capability of how to draft a convention that would protect, be a guideline and protect the rights of persons with disabilities. We, uh, this year in Zero Project, are, are try, are, have the thematics of accessibility. Well, accessibility is, in Article 9 of the convention, fundamentally, a, the purpose of living independently and participate fully in all aspects of life. And therefore, it asks the state, it mandates the state to give full physical environment, transportation, ITC, and other technologies and systems. Not only building roads, and I want to stress the part about information technology because we, we believed at the time, and I, thought, I think we were, we were not mistaken, that the evolution of technology would be uh, would be one of the great highlights of the century. And the use of that technology for all human beings would be a change in our societies. But let me give you the numbers, because uh, in, in, in numbers we talk when we draft budgets, when we talk about policy making, when we talk about public policy and convincing politicians, uh, we, we have to talk about numbers. According to the World Health Organization and the World Bank, there are a billion persons with disabilities around the world. 80% of those are on the, in the underdeveloped world. Uh, I would hesitate to, to say this, but uh, my, my impression is that for every person with a disability, you have two parents, or you have a family. So if you multiply that billion by two, you have, and, and, and add, you have three billion people who either know a person with a disability, have in their midst a person with a disability, or have to take care in a communal basis on the person with disability. But we are seeing another phenomenon in demographics, which is the aging of our, of our society. As we age, we'll, we will be disabled. You, you're, you're either born with a disability, you, uh, you, you acquire a disability during your life by accidents, by sickness, by war, or by whatever, by, by whatever cause, but as you age, and we will all age, and we will all have a, a certain type of disability. At the present moment, it's calculated that 11% of our pop, the world population is aging. And by 2050, 22% of the population will be aging. That will bring 2.100 million people into the same realm. So we're talking in the billions of people who require universal access, who require universal design, who require technologies that will make their lives better, 
will make their, 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 their education and their preparation, their health better. But how, how can we talk about this issue without talking how to change societies? Because the purpose of this convention is not that states follow the guidelines we put on them, but how a society must change. And the change in our societies is a change that we have to deal with uh, in ourselves. We have to first change ourselves, our communities, our societies. And we should begin by that change because we have cultural, uh, cultural uh, connotations or aspects that impede our full appreciation of diversity. We have uh, even religious fears. We have ignorance on the issues of disability. We have this societal fear on anything that is different. So we have to change our attitudes. And these attitudes have to be changed by changing the way society looks at this and the perceptions that are created. We have to change our beliefs. It's uh, from, a, I, I want to use a word which is seldom used in English, but it is a revolution in our value systems that we are looking for. It is a profound aspect to talk about these things where we must change our societies to be inclusive, to privilege diversity, to being different as an aspect of not only what we want, but what we should have as human beings, contributing in different ways to our human condition. The convention created a committee of 18 experts, and these 18 experts meet in Geneva twice a year to monitor the reports of the 175 countries. Uh, I would suggest that if you want to deal more in the legal framework of what this com uh, committee has drafted, uh, the general comment number two on accessibility is an extensive study of the committee on what accessibility means for these countries uh, to, to, uh, to address when they address their reports to the committee. We have to move governments, but let me be qualify that. We have to move states, and governments are not the only ones who are responsible for this. Civil society must contribute to make governments, to make parliaments, to make uh, their societies understand this, this issue. It is vital for persons with disabilities that we all act collectively to look for a better world in ourselves. I would like to t talk about the SDGs and say that we had a success in the negotiation of the SDGs. For many of us, it was not a success. Because the SDGs, as you know, are a basis, a, do a, a, a common denominator of the, of the least common denominator that all these 90, 193 countries can agree upon. The, the, these were lowered in their expectations to meet all the, the conditions of these countries, and even that, many countries will not meet the SDGs by the year, by, uh, by in 15 years of work, by the year 2030. So we have to look at this as a reality. Uh, we tried to get this ability into the description of these SDGs. We have them in some of the methodologies, but they had a diplomatic term called no one left behind. Uh, we were not really satisfied with having no one left behind because it means nothing and everything. We wanted this ability to be, to be there. What is the challenge? I, I pose to you that the challenge is the full realization of the rights of persons with disabilities. To meet all their aspirations and dreams our, in our societies, in a society of inclusion. I have posted only two slides here to give you the impression of what G3ICT does. I'm very honored to belong to this group which began uh, in, uh, which began uh, in the year 2006 when the convention was, uh, was, was ratified, was, was approved by the General Assembly. Um, and I know that the date it was approved because it was the 13th of December. I, I, I normally tell a joke because on the 13th, uh, the 13th of December is my birthday. <laughs> it was the best gift I've had. They, we have to look at this issue 
from a perspective of civil society and zero, the Zero Project Conference is an ideal place to look into what the challenges of the future will mean to the, this enormous community of persons with disabilities that is growing because as we age, we will be more. So I leave you with a thought that in our dreams, we, look, we must look for a better world, but a better world based on human rights and the, and, and the respect of human dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luis, for opening up this morning um, and for talking to us about the inclusion revolution that needs to exist. Um, also, for those of you, your session, there's going to be a session in M2 on G3 ICT at 9.40. So if you want to follow up, um, you'll be there in that room. So thank you very, very much for opening for us this morning. Our second speaker um, is coming back and a return visitor. So it's wonderful for us to have um, Immaculada was with us actually at the very opening of the Zero Project when we were in the Palais in 2012. And this is the first time you've come back, Immaculata, isn't it? And it's much bigger than it was. So it is wonderful. Maybe you can reflect on the scale of the room. Mind you, there's not lots of people here that is not reflecting what's going on yesterday. But um, it is wonderful to have Immaculata um, back with us today. So please, a massive round of applause. Okay, thank you very much. Really, it's, it's really an honor to be here with all of you and have seen uh, how this conference has uh, grown throughout the years and to become really a meeting point of, 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 of uh, real um, experts and people interested in the, in the uh, implementation of policies related to, to disabilities. Um, when I started preparing for this, uh, for this speech, I read carefully the instructions and I loved the first instruction I got. It is, don't complain about barriers. Everybody knows them. Good, so I decided then to focus on the solutions and to share with you um, the, the work um, that um, we have been doing uh, in order to obtain solutions for accessibility. I'm going to focus my presentation on the accessibility legislation that um, we've been uh, preparing. But uh, while doing that, I want to share with you the path to arrive to that legislation. Um, I have to say that when I was reflecting on it, on, on, on the work done, um, my first feeling was, don't despair. It takes really time. Today we have the convention. The, uh, Ambassador Gallegos has said we have a, a great framework. We have a lot of uh, guidelines and information with, uh, with uh, the comment uh, number two. And uh, there are a lot of experience, nevertheless, when we want to make legislation, we have to make, go through that process of change, convince people and, and, um, and uh, prepare really um, the world for a different way of thinking about accessibility. If we cannot start, I mean, we didn't start uh, from the beginning thinking, let's make a great accessibility legislation. In fact, we started very small and I think this is important that we share that with you. For those of, of you that are beginning on accessibility, you know, really is good to start small. We started uh, looking to small projects, research projects on, on ICT uh, accessibility, um, developing some um, collaborative initiatives in transport, uh, getting knowledge about uh, the built environment, and by doing that, we enter into a path I mean, and I personally really enjoyed that path of getting to know people, getting to know experts, and gathering knowledge. Gathering uh, a knowledge, gathering, gathering guidance, getting the experience of others that helped us to, to, to really develop then in a more focused way, the way that we wanted to go ahead with, with, with legislation. I think also um, in that path, it's really essential to put 
um, accessibility in all opportunities that we have in policy documents. I mean, um, whether we are talking about, you know, development cooperation, whether we are talking about uh, education, employment, put accessibility there, make it visible. It is really essential. It's not enough for us to have um, an accessibility legislation. It's great, it's important, it's the basis, but we need to keep to keep accessibility in the in the uh, agenda, and then, of course, uh, in that context, we have to be able to refer to this framework, to this reference, which would be the accessibility legislation. Um, when uh, I would like now to share with you the key, the essence of the Accessibility Act. This legislation is really comprehensive. It deals with many areas uh, and many sectors, as indicated, of course, as relevant in the Convention. Um, we deal with ICT, we deal with, with um, transport, and we deal with the built environment. But we are also going as specific in different, in different sectors, thematic sectors, like, uh, like uh, telecommunications, audiovisual media, and so forth. Anyway, what is the act? The Accessibility Act contains two pillars, two legs. The first one is about selecting a number of products and services and define accessibility requirements for those, functional requirements. We really, in the Act, specify who has to do what, which are the actors. Is there the manufacturers? What's the role of the, produ of the producers? What's the role of the importers? What's the role of developers? What's the role of service providers? And then we have the second leg. The second leg focuses on the public sector. And it says, it says that for funding, for procuring, public authorities need to use the same accessibility requirements. We are matching demand and supply. We are matching public sector with private sector with the same functional accessibility requirements. So which products and services we cover? Um, we have computers, operating systems, ATMs, uh, telephones, TVs, um, transport, audiovisual media, banking services, e-books, a strong ICT component. Ambassador Gallego mentioned that. We share that, that view that the future is in, in technology and it needs to be accessible. We also have e-commerce. Imagine all websites who sell products and services online will be accessible. I hope really we will be able to, to implement this and achieve this. So, what the Accessibility Act does is to have, as I said, a set of functional requirements. What's the reward when you fulfill those requirements? You get access to the wide European market. Products and services will freely circulate in the European market when they are accessible. We have a part of the Act that deals with enforcement, very important. We start very soft. First, Economic operators will declare that they comply. Then we have public authorities checking on that compliance, hoping that they have nothing to do because all compliance is fine. If not, they can take remedial actions. But finally, we empower users to be able to use um, uh, proceedings in courts if necessary in order to complain about lack of compliance. We have also some safeguards um, embedded because we know that um, accessibility should be reasonable and should not impose a disproportionate burden. And we are very careful not to amend sectorial legislation. We build on what the sector has already. This is the essence of the Accessibility Act. Today we are in uh, discussions with the three European legislators co-legislators, the Commission made a proposal, Parliament and Council had their views, and we are starting the process of um, agreeing on the final text. I hope that in the next uh, conference I will be able to, um, to, um, 
to share with you that, uh, final, uh, that final text. Let me tell you to, to, to finish uh, to a, a couple of thoughts. First, that um, we can, I, cannot, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of requiring accessibility in funding, when public authorities fund, fund, and also on procurement. We also have got pieces of legislation in Europe that require that, ensuring accessibility. But we need desperate that definition of accessibility as stated in the Accessibility Act. Not everybody is an accessibility aspect, neither the funding officer, nor the procurers officers, and they need to be able to reference um, legislation that describes that. Of course, we also use technical standards if we want to go into more detail. But they provide only the guidance. The rules in the legislation need to be very, very clear. To finish, to really finish, um, I have shared with you the path of accessibility, the, 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 the accessibility legislation that we have. But I would like to say that accessibility is just an instrument. It's just one of the instruments to achieve the equal access. Let's not forget the importance of having accessibility embedded in um, equal treatment legislation. It is an element, and we need both accessibility and assistive technology, reasonable accommodation, um, all individualized solutions. Only by matching the two of them together, we will achieve the equal access. When we see accessibility, we have to think it as a tool, a tool for the end of equal access. And I hope we will, with this Accessibility Act, be a little bit, a little step closer to achieve equal access. Thank you. That was under time. Um, and also, can I just say, I owe you a huge apology. This is the flu getting to my head. I didn't even give you a proper introduction. That was, a, I'm so sorry. Um, Immaculada um, Valencia Porero, uh, DG Employment for the European Union. I'm so sorry, my brain is just soggy. Now, what's more important to me is, does it sound like you might come back next year to the conference? Yeah, I picked that up. Did anybody else pick that up? I think we'll hold her to that, right? I think we will. And thank you for focusing on solutions. Really, really important. Um, are you going to be around with us for the rest of the day? Great. So a big round of applause for Makalada, and I apologise for my <laughs> appalling introduction. Um, I'm generally I'm going to make a selfish call out. If there is genuinely a doctor in the house, can you come up to me? I, I feel like I'm losing my, my marbles right now, so I'd love to see a doctor if there's one around. Meet me at the back of the room so I don't continue to make more mistakes. Now, we're going to make a little point here, a little bit of theatre uh, for our third keynote speech. We are delighted to have Bobby Cardano here with us from the U University of Gadeo. But now, what I'm going to make a really important point. Bobby is going to speak from this side of the room. And I think what we wanted to make the point is because from this side of the room, there will be better communication from an interpretation and translation point of view. If Bobby was to communicate from this side of the room, this podium is too big and we would not be able to communicate effectively. Now, it's really interesting because this is just a small piece around accessibility. In the, room, in the other room, M2, we have a podium that goes up and down. In this key room, main room, this podium doesn't. And I think what Bobby wanted to make a point about is people who have an experienced disability have a really quick tenacity and flexibility and solution-solving mind. So Bobby's making two points. One is we need to ensure we have podiums that go up and down to ensure that everybody can actually communicate effectively from a podium and be seen and heard. And secondly, to prove that we're all about solutions. So Bobby, it is wonderful to have you. A big round of applause for Bobby Codano. Do you want the mic? <laughs> Thank you, sorry. 
Thank you so much, Caroline, for that wonderful introduction and for the, the explanation of how the room is set up this morning. One of the challenges with language diversity that we often have to think about as we enter various spaces is one that you saw this morning. So thank you, Ambassador Gallegos, for an extraordinary talk this morning and for your leadership. And I want to share personally that us in America, many of us have not given up on the UN Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities, and it will happen. So thank you for your work. And I'm pleased to be on this stage with two wonderful leaders, including Ms. Placencia. So thank you for your comments as well. I give my greetings to your Royal Highness, Excellencies, Martin Essel, all of the participants who are here at this convention. I want to first talk to you about Gallaudet University and why we exist. Gallaudet was first founded in 1864. It is the first time and in the only time in the history of the world where a government has sanctioned the rights of deaf people to receive a college education through the use of sign language and English in its written form. So when Gallaudet was first founded, this was about 200 years ago, where we brought two educators from France who used the methodologies of teaching, teaching pedagogy as it related to sign language, with the notion that sign language was the bridge to a spoken language. And that was the methodology used in France at that time. So two deaf instructors from France came to America and started a rich history, a rich legacy of learning through sign language and English. After about 100 years, the students graduating from those schools for the deaf across the country, some of those students were asking the question, why don't we have a college and how can we pursue higher education for ourselves? And that led to the great vision, the idea that deaf students can get higher education access and have the same opportunities just as other human beings do in our society. And that was the great vision for establishing Gallaudet. So people within our community went to Congress, and the charter was signed by President Abraham Lincoln in 1864. And that led to the establishment of Gallaudet. But it didn't, the story did not end there. In the last 153 years, we've seen that there have been four seismic events that have taken place in my lifetime. So you can imagine, in the short period of history, this is in the rest of the world. Those four seismic events have been that at Gallaudet University, Gallaudet was a place where we discovered that sign language in America, American Sign Language, was seen as a natural, viable language, just like spoken French, spoken German, Arabic, Spanish, and English. ASL was finally seen as a natural language, not just a gestural system that people often thought. So that then led to the next question that if we do have a language for our community, does that mean that deaf people and signing people also have a culture? And in fact, we do. We have literature, we have theater, we have art, we have all the different elements that go into having a culture. And when people identify as having a language and a culture, that then led to the next seismic event. And that's when our students at Gallaudet led a movement in 1988. And that woke our community to our our own civil rights, and that was in 1988. Our students at Gallaudet shut down the university. I think that many of you have heard the stories about Gallaudet at that time. So the students shut down the university, and the reason why is because after 124 years, they had been waiting for a deaf 
person to become the president of Gallaudet University. And they declared that deaf people can do anything and that deaf people must hold these higher positions. And that led to the first appointment of our first deaf president of Gallaudet University, which was Dr. I. King Jordan. And the interesting piece here is that during that event in our history, that is the reason why I'm here with you all today. I am serving now as the 11th president of Gallaudet University. And I'm the first deaf female president of Gallaudet. And what's interesting is that I am not only the president of Gallaudet, I'm not only the president of a university, but I am the president of a place that is referred to as a beacon of hope for deaf people all over the world. You cannot travel to any country in the world, including countries like Malaysia, without there being a deaf child who asks someone if they're from Gallaudet and if they've ever heard of Gallaudet before. So we are a beacon of hope for deaf people, whether they come to our campus or not. And the fourth seismic event that has happened in the last 12 years is the scientist, scientific discoveries that have really changed 300 years of brain research. What we have come to find is that the brain is seeking out patterns of language, regardless if that is happening through one's ears or one's eyes. The brain stores language in the same area of the brain, which is right here. And that scientific discovery shows that the brain is not discriminating against language. It's people who do. And that concludes the historical lesson of my presentation for this morning. Now I'd like to shift and move us to talking about the role of inquiry. You know, I'm donning my presidential hat, and I think that one of the most important values of higher education is thinking about asking questions and learning together as a community. And I think that the theme of this conference is accessibility, and we've all come here and we've been excited to think about how to learn more about accessibility. And in my time here and being at the conference, I've noticed that we've been using two words interchangeably. We've been using the word accessibility, and we've also been using the word inclusion. And in thinking about these terms, I wonder if we might not need to be reminded to make sure that we are very careful and intentional in our thought process for the words that we use, to make sure that we really understand the nuances and the intent that's really driving the words that we're choosing to use. So for example, when we're using these phrases, like accessibility and inclusion, are we really clear who holds the power to determine access? And are we clear who holds the power to establish the norms that will then determine access? So there's one example that I'd like to give you. When we're talking about access and inclusion, do we ever really ask ourselves simple questions like can a signing individual truly have access in an all spoken language environment? And would that access and inclusion be the same as if one signing individual were within a strictly signing environment? 
When you visit Gallaudet University, that is the experience that you have. It's the difference, it's the impact of being in an all signing environment and our ability to be able to fully participate in all the various experiences there. So I invite you to come and experience our campus for yourselves. When we think about these questions, we have to ask ourselves, who decides and who determines whether accessibility has been achieved? Who is it that we are asking? Is it ourselves? Are we asking someone else? We need to look at who it is that we are asking that question of. And we also need to ask our, our, ourselves the question that in various environments, who is really the one who is required to adapt? And you could hear from uh, the different presentations that we had this morning and even from yesterday that we have been doing a wonderful job of setting up regulations, legislation, to clarify what it is that we'd like to create in the world. And I think that that is wonderful. And as we heard, the risk that those legislation, pieces of legislation and regulation will then look at really trying to satisfy the minimal standards. And I think that that's where the tension lies. That's what we're dealing with every day, that it's only looking to satisfy that minimal standard. So that means that the risk is there. We risk missing out on the opportunity for embracing the value and the complexity of our diversity. We are at risk of missing out on the opportunities to embrace the complexities of our diversity, including language diversity. So what I have been thrilled to see is that being at this conference, seeing that the people who are here, they are really seeking to be innovative and creative. We are looking beyond meeting those minimal standards to create change and to have everlasting impact. The Zero Project and the Accelerator Program is a great example of that. And there are four points for what I believe will help us shape our future together. The first is that accessibility is most effective when it creates an authentic, sorry. So access is most effective when the approaches are centered on different ways of being. And let me say that again. So the first point is that access is most effective when our approach is really centered on people's different ways of being, those that are present among others. Second, transformation will happen when we create authentic ecosystems that are based on those different ways of being. And that is the reason why, with diversity and different ways of being, why that is so important. And if we look at the different specific projects that were mentioned here, the 10 that were selected for the Accelerator program, including one from the wonderful colleague that we have at Gallaudet University with Melissa Mouse-Kuhn and her storybook app, they are providing creative answers for millions of people and they are opening doors. Doors for learning that are critical to the future for all of us. Third, the concept of choice, opportunity, connections, and meaning will do more to influence our work. And how we will capitalize on the meanings, the choices, and values that we hold to make sure that our work is preserving our diversity.
And there are many new opportunities that are coming. There are fantastic leadership opportunities for all of you as you leave this conference. And these are just four questions that I ask you to carry with you as you continue to do your work every day. I am so grateful to Martin Essel for the opportunity to be able to share thoughts with you today. The Essel Foundation and the Zero Project really get what Gallaudet stands for. We are unique, we are proud, we are innovative, and we have been redefining possibilities, and we've been part of shaping the future all along. And we at Gallaudet University invite you to get to know us, to partner with us, and to come and visit our campus, and invite us to come and visit all of you. We are looking forward to deepening our relationships with all of you and building a future together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bobby. Um, I don't even know where to begin, but it is fantastic to have you in the leadership position in Gallaudet, and it is an extraordinary example. Um, and a huge congratulations. I, uh, amazing. Um, and I think leadership is the key here. And we have three wonderful leaders behind us to open up here this morning. So can you please put a robust round of applause, please, for, for Bobby and for Maculada and Louise. Leadership and people with disabilities in key positions and leading, leading, leading and ensuring that this stays at the top in the minds of influence and leadership across the world is essential. So I just want to, to ask you all, because now we have a very busy day, it's a long day today. So reminding you all about your sandwiches because we need food. Um, I want to make sure that everybody is getting fed. So remember, you've got your voucher that is all open in the boots from 11.30. So make sure you do that. We will be having a view of the rotunda for a very special gift that Martin Essel is giving the UN today, which is really, it's, it's a really, really important moment with our relationship with the UN. And then we'll be having the award ceremony tonight. Now, there are more of you in the room, so I'm going to repeat it. For those of you who are getting an award tonight, will you please find your anchor. Your anchor has been in touch with you via email before two o'clock today because we want to make sure our award ceremony is going to go smoothly. We have 83 awardees, that's a lot. Um, so we just want to make sure that we will flow this easily. You guys have been incredible around timing. So if you can please, each of you as awardees, get in touch with your anchors, that would be incredible. Now, you're going to break up into your rooms, get coffees in hand, um, and we have M1, M2, and M3. To start off in M1, we have universal design in the built environment. I'm doing a shout out to the Irish, who will be there. Uh, I'd like to point out I'm not wearing green because I'm Irish. I'm wearing it for zero. Today's color is a little bit more, but please go to that room. The second one, M2, is the G3 ICT. Luis will be there to do that. And then we have in M3, orientation map apps. Now, that's got to get you going for this morning. So off you go. Have a great day. And we will see you back later for fun, celebration, food, and awards. Okay, guys. Later. <laughs>